In this lecture, we're going to do a quick round robin on a couple of other common greenhouse pests that you might see in your aquaponic growing environment or you might not. But it's good to have at least a first glance at some of these pests so that if you do happen upon these insects in your growing environment, you know what you're looking at. The first insect that we're going to discuss is fungus gnats. And fungus gnats are relatively common in media beds particularly if your media beds are unkept or if the water level in your media bed is too high. Fungus gnats love to live in biofilm that develops on the surface of media beds and biofilm that develops because of unkept media beds and leaf litter and debris resting on the surface of your media bed. The number one line of defense against fungus gnats is to maintain clean media beds and to ensure that the water level in your media beds is appropriately below the surface of the stone. Additionally, as we see in the left-hand photo, those are beets being cultivated in a rock wool cube in an NFT gutter. If you're cultivating long cycle crops or crops that will be grown in the same grow site in the same grow media for an extended period of time, and you're utilizing something like rock wool or oasis cubes or another type of grodan cube, those cubes have a habit of facilitating a biofilm over time and a algae inside of the grow cube that can create the perfect environment into which fungus gnats can lay their eggs and larvae can develop. So if you're growing long cycle crops, it's recommended that you use a grow cube or a plant holding device that's able to survive the long term stay in the aquaponic system environment without decomposing or facilitating the growth of a biofilm around the plants that you're trying to cultivate. Fungus gnats can lay more than 150 eggs in their short little life, and so fungus gnat populations have a tendency to grow very quickly. The larvae of the fungus gnat eat developing roots and rotting organic material inside of your beds. And so again, this is why we want to maintain clean media beds in order to decrease incidences of insects such as fungus gnats. Additionally, the larva will burrow into the main root of the plants that you're cultivating in your media bed, or in rock wool cubes such as the beets in the left-hand photo, and they can introduce a number of diseases, fungal infections, and pathogens. In the right-hand photo, we see a large number of fungus gnat eggs, and I took this photo after doing a wash of some substrate that was in the surface of a rather unkept media bed at one of the schools that we work with. And so I took some of the substrate off the top of the media bed, washed it, and ran under the microscope. And there were just these large clumps of fungus gnat eggs all throughout the surface of their media bed. And if you poked around in their media bed or disturbed the beds in any way, it was like clouds of fungus gnats would come out of the media bed. So it really is very important that you maintain a clean environment inside of your aquaponic system to mitigate a wide range of pest problems, fungal infections, molds, and mildews. When we talk about fungus gnat prevention, the most important thing is to keep all of the growing equipment clean of rotting organic material and algae. You can use sticky cards or surveying cards in order to survey the populations of fungus gnats in your growing environment, and these same cards can be used to survey for a wide range of greenhouse pests and to survey for your beneficial populations. Additionally, potato surveys can be used to survey for fungus gnat larvae in your media beds. Potato surveys are conducted by taking slices or wedges of raw potato and laying them on the surface of your media bed. This will entice the fungus gnat larva to climb upward out of the media bed and into the potato. You can place the potato wedges under a microscope and determine the relative number or intensity of your fungus gnat population in your beds. If you are experiencing a high level of fungus gnats in your growing environment and they're causing crop damage or they're just unsightly on your produce, I highly recommend using apple cider vinegar traps to aid in managing the adult fungus gnat infestation. Vinegar traps simply involve placing apple cider vinegar inside of small cups and positioning them around the areas of your growing environment where you happen to have large populations of fungus gnats. 
the apple cider vinegar will attract the fungus gnat adults and they will fall into the apple cider and die. The next insect that we're going to look at is drain flies. And these are also called moth flies or sink flies or sewer gnats. They're often found in media beds and on dirty equipment. Drain flies thrive on debris and the biofilm on pipes and drains. Drain flies are mostly a pest because they are unsightly, but they can transmit diseases and fungal infections throughout your growing environment. As we'll notice from this close-up photo, drain flies are small gray flies with broad fuzzy wings and feathery antenna. And the feathery antenna is one of the key characteristics of drain flies that will help you to distinguish them from other flying insects in your growing environment. Spider mites are another insect that are not uncommon to find inside of an aquaponic growing environment. They're often found around the seeding trays or the nursery sites of your aquaponic growing facility. Spider mites are a six-legged mite and they're commonly found on the undersides of leaves. Spider mites are typically recognized by small webs that they build on your plants as pictured in the right hand photo. You typically won't actually see the spider mites themselves because they are incredibly small. In the left hand photo we see a spider mite that I found while doing the substrate wash for surveying fungus gnats. They are incredibly small and so you won't necessarily see the spider mites themselves but if you have spider mites in your growing environment you're going to notice it because you're going to see these small webs growing on your plants. Spider mites puncture plant tissues and feed on the fluids in your plants. The unfortunate thing about spider mites is that spider mite populations can grow rather quickly because they're sexually active when they're only five days old and they can lay up to 20 eggs per day for about a four week window. When discussing preventing and managing spider mites in your aquaponic growing environment, it's important to know that water stressed plants are more susceptible to damage from mites. This is why we typically don't find them in our growing equipment in our media bed plants or on our NFT plants because those plants are typically well watered and maintain a pretty good turgor pressure. Often we'll find spider mites in our germination trays, building webs around the small plantlets as they're germinating out of the rock wool sheets. As spider mites have many natural predators, broad spectrum insecticide use can actually increase the spider mite population. And this is because spider mites aren't very susceptible to most soft sprays such as neem oil or insecticidal soaps, but the beneficials and natural predators that prey on spider mites are rather susceptible to those sprays. So if you have spider mites in your growing environment and it becomes a problem, don't use broad spectrum insecticides because you're just going to knock back the beneficials that are preying on your spider mites and your spider mite population will actually grow. If you have a spider mite population in your greenhouse and it's bad enough that you need to address it or treat for it or manage it, I highly recommend using beneficials. And beneficial insects for spider mites include predatory spider mites, which don't feed on your plants, spider mite destroyer lady beetles, and six spotted thrips. There are also a couple of other beneficial insects that prey on spider mites, but these are my primary go-to's when I'm addressing a spider mite problem in a growing environment. One of my least favorite pests to come across in a growing environment is thrips. Thrips have slender bodies, are winged, and they have puncturing mouthpieces. It's important to make the distinction here that vegetative thrips that feed on your plant matter are pests while carnivorous thrips, such as those used to control spider mite populations, are useful beneficials. Reproduction of thrips is heavily dependent on environmental factors such as temperature and the nutrient density of the food sources. Typically, you won't see thrip in your growing environment. This is another pest where you're going to be looking out for the symptoms of thrip rather than the thrips themselves. In this photo here of a bok choy leaf, we can see that this bok choy plant was heavily populated with thrip. 
the rip will leave this mottled appearance and begin to create a dry, dead appearance to the vegetation of your crops. Thrips are incredibly difficult to treat with sprays, as the larvae actually live inside of the plant tissues. So if you come across thrips on a plant in your greenhouse, my number one suggestion is bag the plant carefully and remove it from your growing environment and discard that plant. If it is some sort of plant that's very sentimental to you or has some high market value, you can try to use beneficials to address the thrip population, but quite honestly, thrips are one of the worst pests that you can come across in your growing environment. They're not that common, but if you do get thrips in your growing environment, they're very problematic to deal with. And typically, my recommendation to people is bag the infected plants and get them out of your growing environment as soon as you start to notice the symptoms of thrips on your plants. So what we're looking for is this mottled appearance to the leaves where we start to see patches of necrotic tissue and the general leaf of the plant starts to appear dry and almost burnt and very brittle. And those are kind of the basic symptoms of thrips attacking your plants. And again, if you see this, bag the plant and get rid of it. The last bug that we're going to talk about is the brown marmorated stink bug. It's important to remember when you see stink bugs in your growing environment or you see insects that look like stink bugs in your growing environment that not all stink bugs are bad. Brown marmorated stink bugs cause damage to fruiting and ornamental crops. And the brown marmorated stink bugs are controlled by Trisoka species parasitic wasps. If we find a stink bug or stink bug-like insect in our growing environment, we're going to want to be able to tell whether it is a brown marmorated stink bug or a brown stink bug, or whether it's a spine soldier bug or some other type of assassin beetle that is actually a beneficial beetle. The two primary features that we're going to look at when distinguishing different types of stink bugs is the shoulder shape and the coloration along the sides of the bug. The brown stink bug is characterized by pointed shoulders and it's not heavily patterned along its sides. The brown marmorated stink bug has smooth shoulders and is heavily patterned along the sides of its body. The spined soldier bug has relatively smooth sloped shoulders and most importantly has a black dot that forms from the overlapping wing tips. The brown stink bug is an agricultural pest and typically plagues vineyards and orchards, while the brown marmorated stink bug is often found in greenhouse environments and is a greenhouse pest. The spined soldier bug, however, is actually a beneficial predatory insect, and we want to maintain those in our growing environment if we happen to find them. 